Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Metri. I thought for a while, what do I want to talk about tonight? And I, I thought about talking about precepts because um, I know we have a precept ceremony coming up this weekend. And I thought maybe I'd talk about that. But then I thought, you know what? You're going to hear so much about precepts on Saturday that the last thing you want to hear is a more about that now. Uh, so I got to thinking about um, how sometimes in the Dharma, our intentions get misunderstood. And maybe it's misunderstood by our teacher. Maybe it's misunderstood by our friends or our, uh, our, our fellow devotees. But we do something and then, you know, people ask a question like, well, why did Minwe do that? Or why did Malinta do that? And why didn't she do it this way? It, it, you ever had people ask you that? And, and I bet you, I bet you a million dollars here. Um, Malinta has that happen to her all the time. She lives in Sri Lanka in a very terrible country. And I bet people ask her all the time, why do you sit with a Zen guru? Why, why, do, you, why do you listen to these Mahayanists? Um, and people don't really understand our intentions. And they don't really understand. I, I've, I've suffered from this before myself. Um, mostly when I practice with a Zen group, and I was practicing also with a Theravada monk. And, uh, and people didn't understand my intentions. And, um, and honestly, I didn't understand what my intentions were either. Uh, and I was trapped in a world of dualism for quite a while in my journey uh, towards better understanding the Buddha Dharma. Uh, but I found a sutta in the uh, Kurka Nikaya uh, that really drives this home to me. And I wanted to share it with you guys tonight um, because I think it, it, it tells us something that we shouldn't always be so close to jump to conclusions about what other people are experiencing or what their path is. So uh, this is called the Kali Goda, the Kali Goda Sutta. And um, it's about a monk called Badiya Kali Goda. And I want to, uh, I guess, preface, the, preface this by, if you're not familiar with the um, various baskets of discourses that are that are in the various traditions, and in this case, the the, the Theravadan tradition. Uh, there's the middle length discourses. There's the uh, long discourses. There's the uh, connected discourses, etc. And so there's a lot of these. There's the numerical discourses. Well, there's also um, the Kurika Nikaya which is basically a collection of short sayings. Uh, this actually is a full sutta that I'm going to share with you tonight, but you'll see why later at the end, um, the Buddha recites a poem. And, uh, and so that's why this is included in there, because it's the poem itself that um, allowed the monks to continue to memorize these and pass these down through, through thousands of years of tradition. So anyway, so let me share with you most of this uh, Kali Goda Sutta, and then I'll, I'll elaborate just a little bit. And so it goes like this. I have heard that on one occasion, the Blessed One was staying near Anupiya in the, mango, in the mango grove. And on that occasion, Venerable Badiya, Kali Goda's son, on going into the wilderness, to the root of a tree or to an empty dwelling, would repeatedly exclaim, what bliss, what bliss. A large number of monks heard Venerable Badiya, Kali Goda's son, on going to the wilderness, to, to the root of a tree or to an empty dwelling, repeatedly exclaim, what bliss, what bliss. And on hearing him, the thought occurred to them, there is no doubt but that Venerable Badiya, Kali Goda's son, doesn't enjoy leading the life, the holy life. For when he was a householder, he knew the bliss of kingship. So that now, on recollecting that when going to the wilderness, to the root of a tree, or to an empty dwelling, he repeatedly exclaims, what bliss, what bliss. And I think when I read this in English, Kali Goda is going, and he's going to meditate. And when he does this, he's saying, what bliss, what bliss. 
But I think in English, kind of the translation that people are hearing is, what bliss? What bliss? And that's why people were confused. You see? And so even though it's just intonation of the first word or the second word or whatever, they thought he was mocking, you know, this is not blissful. But instead, he was actually exclaiming, what bliss, what bliss. How easily people misunderstand what we're trying to say or what we are experiencing. So these monks, they went to the Buddha. And they, so, it's, so the sutta goes on like this. It says, so they went to the Blessed One. And on arrival, having bowed down to him, sat to one side as they were sitting there. They told him, Venerable, Venerable Badiya, Kaligoda's son, Lord, on going to the wilderness, to the root of a tree or to an empty dwelling, repeatedly exclaims, what bliss, what bliss. There is no doubt but that Venerable Badiya doesn't enjoy leading the holy life, for when he was a householder, he knew the bliss of kingship. So that now, on recollecting that when going to the wilderness, to the root of a tree or to the empty dwelling, he repeatedly exclaims, what bliss, what bliss. I, I point this out that this seems very repetitive. Um, and for those of you who haven't studied the Pali Canon too much, a lot of the suttas are very repetitive because it was this repetition reciting the same concept over and over again that made it easy for the monks to memorize. And they would memorize them this way. And it was easy for them to then pass them on through the generations. Remember, they didn't have this uh, Prakrit language that they were using, um, whether it was Pali or whether it was a, a different Prakrit language, they didn't have it in a written form at the time. These were all passed down orally. So a lot of these suttas are very repetitive that way. And then, so it goes on that the Buddha tells to these monks, okay, guys, go find Badiya and bring him to me and tell him just like this. They say, hey, friend Badiya, the, the blessed one wants to see you. Would you come and see him? So they all said, okay, Buddha, we'll go and do that. So they took off and they ran down the street, went out into the woods and they found Venerable Badiya. And they said, uh, hey, friend Badiya, the Blessed One wants to see you. Come on back with us and uh, come and talk to the Blessed One. And Badiya was delighted. You know, he wanted to talk to the Buddha. He's like, of course, you know, I'm happy to. So he comes back and uh, he, like, like the tradition is in all situations, especially when dealing with the Buddha, but also as one does with, with one's teacher, you know, he bowed to the Buddha and then he sat down to one side. Uh, it was considered rude in the tradition to sit right directly in front of your teacher. So they always sat to one side. Um, so Badia sat down to one side of the Buddha. Um, and he said like this, he says, um, and again, it gets a little bit repetitive, but it says, when, what compelling reason, the Buddha asked Badiya, he says, what compelling reason do you have in mind that when going to the wilderness, to the root of a tree, to an empty dwelling, you repeatedly exclaim, what bliss, what bliss? Badiya answered this way, before, when I was a householder, Maintaining the bliss of kingship, Lord, I had guards posted within and without the royal apartments, within and without the city, and within and without the countryside. But even though I was thus guarded, thus protected, I dwelled in fear, agitated, distrustful, and afraid. But now, on going alone to the wilderness, to the root of a tree, or to an empty dwelling, I dwell without fear, unagitated confident and unafraid, unconcerned, unruffled, my wants satisfied with my mind like a wild deer. This is the compelling reason I have in mind that when going to the wilderness, to the root of a tree or to an empty dwelling, I repeatedly exclaim, what bliss, what bliss. Then on realizing the significance of that, the Blessed One on that occasion exclaimed, From whose heart there is no provocation, and for whom becoming and non-becoming are overcome, he, beyond fear, blissful, with no grief, is the one the devas can't see. Excuse me, my alarm was going off. I really apologize. 
it's 6 30 in the morning it's time i normally wake up and take my son, get my son ready for school so anyway it probably is telling me i've spoken long enough i i just want to touch on this real quickly because the buddhist poem at the end tells the other monks something it tells the other monks dude you guys were worried about this guy he's fully enlightened that's what he's telling them he's saying from whose heart there is no provocation for whom becoming and non-becoming are overcome. He, beyond fear, blissful with no grief, is the one the devas can't see. I, I wanted to tell this because, as I said before, sometimes we have Dharma friends that just don't understand this. Or maybe we have family members who just don't understand this. They think they know what we're saying or they think they know our experience. But in reality, what they didn't realize, they, they were blaming this Badia fella saying he does, he's not happy here because they're thinking in his head, he was a prince. He was, the, he, was, he was the son of a king. He lived in a palace and he had all these guards and all these uh, palatial apartments. How can he be happy living as a monk in a robe and going out to the forest and sitting under a tree and saying, what bliss, what bliss? They had this preconceived idea in their mind no way he could be happy doing this. And yet, that was the only place he was finding his true happiness, his true bliss. He was free. He was free from the bondage of that cycle of samsara, and he had found bliss. So I just wanted to share that with you today, that sometimes we read suttas and they strike us as something uh, uh, we didn't quite expect, you know? Uh, and that's what I like about this one is I think we've all had people misinterpret our intentions before. They've misinterpreted what we were trying to say or what we were trying to do. But what matters is what it is to us, how Badia was feeling. And he knew how he was feeling. And that was just way, his way of explaining it and exclaiming it. And so the Buddha saw through that very quickly. And I think that is a good lesson to all of us that when we don't know the backstory, or we think we know the backstory, but don't know the whole story, maybe we shouldn't be so quick to judge. Don't be quick to judge, be quick to accept. And when we're quick to accept, we accept the world as it is. And when we truly accept the world as it is, we see the world as it is. Mm -hmm.